you think you could yawn a little louder and more? <laughs> I mean, that, you almost made it. Okay, so today's topic is Introduction to SWIM. SWIM um, is an acronym for a computer program called Stormwater <coughs> Management Model. To you all, the interface is going to look an awful lot like the EPA net interface. They, they are practically identical looking at first glance, but they're much different computer programs. They share concepts of nodes and links, where the nodes in SWIM are either storage elements or just junction elements, and the links can be open channels comprised of conduits, open channels, rectangles, triangles, um, polar bear shaped cross sections, whatever you want. Uh, not the same as EPA net. It solves different hydraulic equations. Gradually, very slow equation. If we make things steady state, it solves a dynamic uh, set of equations called the St. Bernard equations if we do it in unsteady uh, state. This class, we're going to use the unsteady solver, but we're going to give it steady state conditions, um, and that will force it into producing gradually very slow solutions. Okay, it started a long time ago in the 1970s when dinosaurs roamed the Earth. MiG-21 was the fastest Soviet jet. It was a Soviet Union. Actually, different name. Uh, it was written, versions 1 through 4, written in a programming language called Fortran. Um, some of you probably heard of that. And you know that old people learn Fortran. This is usually the third language you learned after your native language, profanity, and then Fortran. Learning Fortran enhanced the profanity and vice versa. Um, in um, 2008, Around 2008, it was refactored into a different programming language called C++, and that's what allowed it to start to have um, a graphical user interface. In the old times, you would build input files, which aren't the hardest thing in the world, but they're also not intuitive. The computation engine in it is considered mature. That's a fancy way of saying it hasn't been broken for a long time. Don't mess with it. The It's in commercial products. So Mike Urban is a product out of DHI. It's a European company um, that uses the SWIM engine for its hydraulics. Um, Delft produces a product called Sobek, which is named after a crocodile, some Dutch word for crocodile. Um, also uses the SWIM engine. XP SWIM is an Australian <coughs> company down under Australia, you know, Sydney and stuff. Um, that clearly uses the uh, uh, SWIM engine because it's got it in its name. And then the XP is extended uh, extended properties. Uh, Civil Storm, I think that's a Bentley product. Um, Hasted was bought by Bentley or vice versa, so they're all kind of the same. It's a very um, well-tested computation engine. Nevertheless, it's very easy for us human beings to give it really bad input and have it not work right. It started out as a simplified hydraulic model, much like the uniform or normal flow equations that we've seen so far. Um, then it evolved to gradually varied flow, and then the dynamic flow, and then it picked up some hydrology capabilities along the way. And by today, it's actually a pretty um, good tool in the hands of someone that has read the entire user. It's useful in urban settings. It can be used in rural settings. It's not often used in rural settings. The preferred product in the United States for stream flow is HECRAS, namely because the data entry is far harder and it uses up much more billable hours just to get it to run. But SWIM has the entire same capability as <coughs> HECRAS. And my personal opinion is I think it's actually really easier to use. But that's here nor there. If I told you to use HECRAS and somebody's signing checks, what am I going to do? I'm going to use HECRAS. In fact, I'm going to do it with a hand tied behind my back to slow myself down so I can bill more hours. Um, it's used for BMP performance estimation. BMP means best management practices, not to be confused with an armored fighting vehicle of the Soviet era from the 1970s, although I used to do that as a graphical thing. But since nobody's old enough anymore to get any significance out of that, it became a stupid site to think. And LID means low impact development or green infrastructure. That's just another acronym because BMP started to be not cool in the industry. So they decided that they would name performance after a unit of measure for marijuana, the mighty lid. Um, 
if you want to download and install it, you, you're going to need it for your um, some homework and some uh, in your second project. If you're a PC user, you can simply Google EPA SWIM, and it should take you one or two top ranked selections. Should be the uh, official EPA website. Um, PC user, you would download the self-extracting archive in the download section. I suggest you download the user manual, although there's copies here if, you, if you're incapable of doing that for some reason. Um, and then run the self-extracting archive. It's just in the EXE file. You double-click on it and it says, I have a grid program. I'd like to make changes to your hard disk. And you go, sure, I don't pay attention to what it's doing. Let it install the EPA malware. It doesn't install malware. Um, if you're on a university network machine, you can go through all that, but it won't allow you to install it. You have to play a trick on it, which is to put in a flash drive and install the software to the flash drive, and then that will work. That's kind of an advanced technique, so um, just be forewarned. Uh, the Citrix stuff is garbage, so I didn't even bother to use it. It's basically, it's free software. The license manager doesn't know how to deal with free software, so Citrix wouldn't work anyway. That's for PC. For Mac users, um, you want to watch that video because the Mac installation is a wee bit more elaborate. Um, you'll, the video is going to tell you, go to this thing and download this file that has an extension .tar. It means tape archive. It says get to your computer. And put the tape, ar tape archive somewhere that makes sense to you. Then create a directory to put the tape archive into. Then extract the tape archive, and it will build the application bundle. It is an application bundle, but the stupidest place you can put it on a Macintosh, there must be some Mac users in here. What's the stupidest place you could put an application you downloaded off the internet that some professor told you to get? The stupidest place is in your applications folder, because that could actually damage useful applications. Um, then when you run it the first time, you do um, control <coughs> Click to launch the software and your security settings. Okay, you download this from the internet from a non-registered software developer, which is Apple's way of saying we don't get a cut of this, so we're not going to let it let it run unless you tell us to. Um, you defeat the security settings. You only have to do that once, and then it will always run on your computer. Um, a little window will come up to say configuring wine prefix. We're going to look like nothing will happen. It takes about a minute, and then. The interface should come up live and running. The video goes through all that because I basically crippled the machine in order to rebuild it. Okay, we're going to take a tour of the interface. We're going to see what nodes and links are, outfall, subcatchments, rain gauges. Um, I think so. Yeah, I think the twelve points. Yeah, we've got thirty minutes. We can do this. Um, date, time, hydraulics, and hydrology. Um, we go into the detail of what nodes are briefly, uh, the difference between a junction node and a storage node, what's meant by invert elevation, which by all you all know is the bottom of the dam pipe, um, and how it represents uh, flooding. Um, on junction nodes, you'll see that there's ordinary and extraordinary, and so it's probably best now for me to get the interface up and running. I have previously installed this at some point in my life. And with any luck, <coughs> that was a sigh of relief. So there's what the SWIM interface looks like. Kind of looks like EPA net. Some of the main differences is the top menu items are a little bit rearranged. And that browser window that used to be way off on the right that was easy to lose is now rigidly fixed to the drawing canvas. So in the interim, they discovered that having disappearable browser windows was a <coughs> stupid idea. So they made that impossible. Okay, so the drawing canvas is where we will draw our drainage network we get to it. Swim needs a mouse because you have to be able to right click. And I can't right click on a touch pad, at least on a Macintosh one, because it doesn't accept the input. 
pocket. So you'll find this would be good to carry a mouse. So just keep a mouse in your pocket at all times. Um, this one's a Manx mouse because there's no tail. Oh no, that was actually funny. Please. <laughs> So up here is the menu items where you get to choose hamburgers, hot dogs, french fries, onion ring things, um, hot apple pies, would you like fries with that, sir, and so forth. The items we have are that thing right there, which looks like a cloud that's like dripping water. The concept in swim is called a rain gauge. If you can think of it as it represents a rainfall input component. <laughs> this next one is called a subcatchment. Think of it like a sub basin in your HEC HMS that we had back in hydrology class. <laughs> Y'all had that, right? <clears throat> sure, you did. Dr. Herman said if you're a Mac user, you're screwed. And then went on. Okay, good. Um, there is Macintosh version of HEC HMS. Uh, the next thing is a circle. <clears throat> which is, you should tell me it's just a junction. Circle represents a junction. An upside down triangle is an outfall node. EPA net had to have a fixed grade node for any network to work. The drainage network model has to have at least one outfall node for the drainage model to work. So this plays the same importance as the one fixed grade node in EPA net. Uh, the triangle is a flow divider. doesn't have flow uniters. Um, a storage node is a different type of junction, indicated by this little thing that looks like it's a bucket full of water. A conduit link is a link. Pump link looks like a pump. An orifice link is a special type of link that behaves like a orifice. Uh, there's weirs. Um, I think outlet link is you can provide outlet rules to a from a storage cell, and then you can add, you can type all over the place in case nothing works good for you. This upper stuff on the interface is very similar to what we had in EPA net. Make it bigger, make it smaller, take Mr. Hand and drag stuff left and right. You got the group hug feature, you got the uh, select an object, some different kinds of output. These graphical outputs are currently disabled because there's nothing for it to graph. Uh, there's a profile plot and the lightning bolt, which does the same thing as the lightning bolt did in EPA net, which does the same thing as the exploding bomb does in HEC HMS. It runs the simulation. Okay, so junctions, you, you normally draw stuff, you draw the junctions and you connect them together, just like uh, in EPA net or in any other kind of link node modeling system. You can't add links till you have something to connect them to before you start a junction. I personally find that I start at the outfall, the upside down triangle, and work upstream. It's just easier for me, so you don't have to do that. Uh, the junction attributes are the invert elevation, that's the elevation at the bottom of the node. The max elevation is the elevation at the top of the node. Should you choose not to pick a max elevation and leave it as zero, which is the default value, then the computer program will determine the largest diameter of whatever is connected to it and use that as the max elevation. So that's nice because at least it will run. That's unnice because it won't let your system go surcharged. So you think you have found a hydraulic solution, but in fact you have not. Um, I find that setting the max elevation, you can either set it so that that elevation corresponds to the land surface, which is handy if you want everything to stay underground, or I usually do land surface plus a little extra distance, like land surface plus one foot, so that if the water plots between those two positions, I know that I'm flooding the ground and I have lurkers and sinkers and floaters, oh my, running around trying to capture the entrance. Uh, when the program runs, it computes depth of the node uh, and then we'll do the appropriate hydraulic calculations, kind of like Hayes and Williams, but it doesn't use that per se, uh, to, to transport along a 
link, but unless we tell it otherwise, that node doesn't have any storage to store it. So, you know, if you imagine a node the size of this room and you had two feet of water in here, we'd be storing a considerable amount of water. Um, unless you tell it otherwise, the computer program ignores that and it simply calculates heads. Um, so here is a sketch of a node right in the middle of the street because that's the smartest place to put manholes is in the middle of the street. So it's easy to get to. Nah. Um, plus you can block both, both traffic directions. You know, everybody likes that, especially with local business owners. So we have Junction J. Um, and the um, top of Junction J is shown there at the street surface. And this has three pipes coming into it. Pipe N minus one. Pipe N, which is coming at you, you better duck if there's flow in it, and pipe N plus one. And there's slopes indicating, or that they're supposed to be obvious in the drawing. Flow should come from N minus one to N plus one, at least based on the slopes in this diagram. <coughs> the junction invert elevation is the location of this <coughs> bottom. That point there, or that distance there, and this distance there, are called offsets. Offset property is assigned to the junk or to the link, not the node. So if this pipe is sloping downhill, this should be an inlet. And when we go ahead and give the information to the program, we'll provide an inlet offset equal to that height. On this one, the flow is supposed to be coming that way, so that would be called an outlet. That would be an outlet offset. And this pipe is coming in at grade at invert, so there's no offset associated with it. Okay, so the program runs. And you can barely see it on the left. Um, these are supposed to be shaded in blue. So on the left one, there should be an H shading about up to here. And the right one is actually going above. So the left one, the node's not flooded. All the water is contained below the max depth of the node. So that's a system that's um, not flooded, although I have it drawn with a pipe to do so. I'm using heads right now. In this case, the node is flooding, and that would indicate that the water wants out. And again, unless we provide input to the program to allow that to happen, what it does is it wastes that water, determines what volume is going to be lost, and it just disappears it from the program. It reports that it threw away water, and you get to the end, your mass balance it shows 70% loss, but no other warning messages. And so like good, uh, dutiful civil engineers, we proceed forward thinking we've actually solved the problem when, in fact, we've identified that we don't have a solution. Um, we can turn on the ability for it to keep track of node flooding, and we can do the elaborate method, which is not this one, or the less elaborate method. You supply an area and a pond to depth, and you tell it where ponding begins and ends. And so if it needs to, it can store water up in this ponded area and then feed it back into the system um, when there is capacity. That's a useful way to simulate at least, because at least you start knowing where your junctions are becoming um, flooded. That could be handy if that junction happens to be in your, in your front yard. The more elaborate ways will replace the node by something called a storage unit, and we provide complete depth storage information for that uh, for that junction, and then that does behave uh, as a storage unit. Okay, so we'll do our first example, which is a rectangular channel. I have got 28 minutes. Yes, I can do this in 28 minutes. Um, so, look familiar? Like EPA net, I'm going to go ahead and screen capture that image, and I can drop it into the background when I uh, when I draw things. So let me get this all set up for screen capturing. Grab capture selection. All right, um, I have to save as a bitmap. with me. I've got to find a particular piece of software that lets me bitmapify that. File, 
save as <coughs> BMI. Okay, so there's my reason I want to do that. Got, got all the information I need for the problem. So I don't want to be flipping back and forth. So we'll now go to our swim. And just like um, if we were in uh, EPA net, we're going to want to load in a backdrop. So we can <coughs> load. And example one, BIM. Okay, so there's my uh, backdrop. I'm going to build a channel in this part of the drawing, but I have all the other information right there. Okay, so every model has to have an upside down triangle. So I'm going to put my upside down triangle right there to represent the zero stationing. And then I'll put a bunch of nodes. Like before, all this is doing is associating picture with picture. There's no uh, geo-referencing here. That should be enough nodes. The nodes are going to be uh, 200 meters apart. And let me go to my project defaults. I want my conduit geometry not to be circles, but I want them to be squares. Bottom width is <clears throat> dang you need to get more sleep man <laughs> okay so 10 meters deep um, one 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 meter wide so now whenever I draw a, um, a link object it's going to be that and we want these to be 200 meters apart Roughness is 0 0.025. Flow units, I want ours to be in CMS, cubic meters per second. Routing method, I'm going to use dynamic. Choose the OK button. Okay, so down here, It has my flow units listed, uh, offsets, and so forth. So we're set to go. Next, I want to choose my choosing my link, and I'm going to do the difficult task of drawing. So I'm drawing from uphill to downhill, which completely violates my usual way of doing it, but it should work for this case. Keep taking notes. The word dynamic routing was pretty important because if I use any of the other two methods, number one, it won't produce the, we won't be simulating what we're trying to simulate. But more importantly, if we draw a flow direction incorrectly, it will fail. When with a dynamic routing, it handles it by just changing the sign of the velocity. And so my network is drawn. Next thing I need to do is supply elevations to those nodes. So we'll set that node alone and go to the first one, which is 200 meters upstream of the outlet. The slope is 0 0.001. So 200 times 0 0.001 is let's try 0.2. Yeah, it's that new map is brutal. Man. So we'll set our invert elevation here at 0.2. Go to the next one, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1.0, 1.0. Two. I'm 
this in the last one, is going to be 1.4. We need to supply a steady flow, so we'll do that at that last step, most upstream one, and we'll go ahead and have a flow rate of 2.5 meters cubed per second. Press OK. Make one more change. So my outfall boundary is a fixed outfall. So it's not the free willing, but it's the fixed one. Other thing for Mac users, the scrolling doesn't work. So I've highlighted it and I'm pressing the right arrow button. Okay, it held it as fixed and I need to supply the depth of two meters. All right, that should be um, the correct setup for this uh, situation. Take 200, and this is called the mini binder. All right, so with any luck, there's literally all my swim modeling. So without the cool backdrop, it looks kind of crummy. It's just a bunch of dots and lines, fingers crossed. Oh, that almost never happened. Picking an arbitrary length, length number two. So the flow, this has been a plot of time series of flow. The initial flow is, is, is zero, but these are, I think, in 15 minute increments, so it should go up to two and a half really quick, or it should go up to. That's not good. So I would speculate that I did not do my. Routings correctly, dates, time steps. <coughs> That's odd. Well, let me plot my profile and try to diagnose what's wrong. My thought was those flow numbers should have been, um, oh, I know exactly what's wrong, but we'll go ahead and do that anyway. Remember how deep I told it to get? I told it to get 10 meters deep. It ignored me and it only made them one meters deep. Okay, so that's easy to fix. Um, get this out of the way. Go to group hug feature. Edit. Group edit. I want to do my conduit. <clears throat> Next step, 10, <clears throat> all right, now let's rerun it and see if it picked that up. Okay, that's, that's better. I forgot that's one of the added bonus features. That particular part doesn't actually work. So you'll have to, um, and then even on the professional programs, it doesn't work. Because after you've spent $50,000 on the professional one, you're asking the one guru to call them up and say, hey, this part doesn't work. And when we can get through it, probably do three weeks, but by then, that would probably be too much. So this is a recording that 15 minutes after the start of the simulation, that's what the water surface um, profile uh, looks like. And if I go on to the map, Meister, and start running it, um, it's not a very interesting water profile in this case, but that is the uh, computed case. So for Grins, <coughs> now that we have it, we can do what if, and let's make it eight feet deep, which I think was another prior example. There's no point in just it's getting to a steady flow in 15 minutes. It's not like we're doing a bunch of rolling here. So now we did some two different simulations: one with two feet deep, one with eight feet deep. And that's that's literally doing an open channel in a swim.
Okay, let's do flow in it. Next one's going to be flow in a sewer. So here we're going to do a five foot diameter sewer, 50 million gallons per day, slope of one part in this small uh, Manning Tandem 0 0.015, and we're going to use six lengths of 2,640 feet. So how would I build that model? <coughs> Only got 14 minutes to go, so how would I build that? Model? 13. So, so we would go back to our model environment, hit file, new. Nine. And there's our model. We're going to need six links. So we'll have our Outfall, so that would be link one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, this particular one is in million gallons per day. So we'll change our flow unit to another genuine draft. Um, the circular pipes. Let's cheat and get the um, 2,640 feet. Part eight pipe two six four zero circles, and we want them to be sixty inches, five feet. Click OK. Hopefully, it actually picks that up. Routing method again will be dynamical. Be dynamic. Million genuine draft conduit roughness. And these in is 0.015. If I can't get the uh, icons to look a little bit. I'm not going to miss it right now. I'm not going to 10 minutes ahead and get it. Well, this is making pretty colors. Nice. Teal. Blue and teal. So we've just um, now drawn our um, pipes. Um, our slope is one part in 8,000. So every increment is 2.6 feet increase in depth. So now we want to go ahead and put our inward elevations. I'm going to make an audible here, and I'm going to make them 2.5 feet because I can do that in my head. So it's 2.5 once. The second one. Is five. Third one is 7.5. Fourth is eight and. And 10. Fifth is 12.5, and the sixth will be 16. 2.5, and um, 15. And because we know we can't trust it to get our pipe diameters right, we'll go ahead and do hug it now. Edit, group edit, conduit, and next depth. Okay. 
let's get the spark key. Spark group by diameter 2640 point zero one five. So that's our types correct. And so the last one we want to put in is our upstream flow condition. <coughs> Whose short term memory remembers what it was? Fifty. Fifty. And in this case, we're going to do. A, I think we'll do a free option. Oh, we're going to do normal. Not Abby normal, but normal. So what normal means is it's going to calculate the normal depth at that point and apply that as a boundary condition. Press the run. It ran. And again, one of the main points of doing this is to extract a profile plot, see where the water is relative to whatever uh, earth interest we have. Okay, so there it is. 15 minutes of simulation. And that looks goofy, doesn't it? Well, yeah, it does look goofy because we're not at equilibrium yet. So we need to um, run our simulation out to equilibrium, which in this case pretty much fills up the main pipe. So 50 million gallons a day into a five-foot pipe pretty much uh, fills it up. Let's examine what happens when we change the downstream boundary condition. So the downstream boundary condition set to free is it's going to apply critical depth at that location. So we'll see if critical depth in a five foot pipe confers any advantages. She's okay. Indeed, free outfall, but a teensy bit of headspace all the way up the pipe. So they are different answers, which is which is what's supposed to happen. Um, if that were our uh, design, it would satisfy the requirement that the water stays in the pipe. That's a good thing. Um, but I would suspect it would be somewhat uncomfortable with that not much. I would much rather have the stuff run at 90 or 75 percent full, and that might be specified by design criteria in a particular case. So that is your introduction to SWIM. There's other there's the other videos um, already uh, that you can watch, um, and then we will pick up next week with more open channel flow and drainage. Have a great weekend, everybody. I will let you know when there's a chance to improve your insurance.